Good morning, everybody, and Merry Christmas. It says this in John 1. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he is here with us. He is Emmanuel. Let's worship him joyfully. Here we go. Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace Hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all He brings, risen with healing in His wings. Mild He lays His glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give him second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. And we adore him. Christ by highest. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord Late in time behold Him come Offspring of a virgin's womb Mount He lays His glory by Born that man no more may die Born to raise the sons of earth Born to give him second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Yes, and we're here to celebrate him. Come behold the wondrous mystery In the dawning of the King He the theme of heaven's praises Robed in frail humanity In our longing, in our darkness Now the light of life has come look to christ who condescended took on flesh to ransom us. come behold the wondrous mystery he the perfect son of man in his living, in his suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we Behold the wondrous mystery 
Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs a lamb in victory see the price of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace unmeasured love untold come behold the wondrous mystery slain by death the god of life but no grave could e'er restrain him praise the lord he is alive of deliverance how unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes oh what a foretaste of deliverance how unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. in darkness deep now see the light of glory the mighty God the Prince of Peace a child to us is born behold the Lamb of God our sin behold the Lamb of God the life and light of men behold the Lamb of God who died and rose again Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away our sin. Wanders in the wilderness now hear a voice is crying prepare the way make straight the path your king has come to die behold the lamb of god who takes away our sin Behold the Lamb of God, the life and light of men. Behold the Lamb of God, who died and rose again. Behold the Lamb of God, who comes to take away our sin. Son 
of God, Son of Man, behold. Christmas to you all on behalf of Rolling Hills Baptist Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to, to join into our service on this Christmas morning celebration of our Savior. And we want to welcome you into that celebration. So, uh, so thankful that you allowed us to be a part of this day with you as you celebrate right where you are, wherever that may be, whatever time that may be. Uh, and so today I'm really excited about what God has done and the message that he has shared for us today. And I was thinking through several different things and, and getting to this place. I actually spent all Monday preparing for it and, and none of the stuff I was preparing for is actually going to be the title nor the topic. So it's just amazing how God works, but I really believe this is something that, that God has laid on my heart. I'm so grateful to be able to share it with you today. And, and so the title really is a, is a simple title, and it is Life Goes On. And, and one of the things that I was thinking about, thinking about Christmas, wanting to do the best that I can, always wanting to do the best that we can for such an incredible Savior, I was thinking about how this monumental birth is like one of the biggest things in all of time in all of history that will ever happen. And as I was reading through it, I was thinking to myself, you know, but the rest of the world seems like life is just going on as normal. And it's really an alarming thing to me, really an amazing thing to think about the Savior, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords coming down. And yet nobody or so many don't even recognize it or realize how big this event is and what is even going on. Uh, so I was thinking through and getting ready for this. The, the, if there's ever been a time in my life where something so big has happened that time just kind of stands still. And, and I'm just curious as to know whether you, uh, right where you are, uh, have ever experienced a situation like that where something so catastrophic maybe or so alarming or so surprising happens and, and to the point that it just feels like for a moment everything stops. And some of us may say COVID time was kind of a similar time where everything stood still. But this, this particular instance, I remember where I was, what was going on, what class I was in, and just for a few moments in time, it was as if everything stopped. Uh, and that was on uh, September the 11th, 2001, whenever uh, the World Trade Centers, you all may remember it, were, were attacked and were bombed. And, and I remember, I, I'm pretty sure I was a sophomore in high school, but I remember the class that I was in, the, 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 basically uh, so many details about that moment because it was in that moment that it felt like, even though I was at school, that everything kind of stood still for the moment to watch. Uh, and I was in, I was actually, 
actually in ROTC class. Uh, it was a Navy ROTC class in Russell County, at Russell County High School. And, and I remember walking, I don't remember what I was doing in particular in the class, but I was walking kind of back and forth and I, I walked and they had the TV on and the TV was playing like the recording of this, this catastrophic, catastrophic event that had taken place. And that was, you know, the planes flying into the World Trade Center. Everyone was alarmed. Everyone seemed surprised. And I remember in that span of time, it was just like everything stood still. And maybe you remember it as well. Maybe you remember uh, that particular moment in time. If you were alive then, of course, you remember what that was like. But all the tragedy that took place, it was such an unexpected seemingly event and occasion and, 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 and it took everyone by surprise or so many by surprise. And, and, and even in the classroom, as, as we were at school that day, everything stopped. And so many times that's what happens when, when big things happen or when shocking things happen. It's just like, like, like everything stops, everything stands still because in that moment, that moment is worthy of all of your attention, of all of your focus, of all of your just trying to process it. And in the moment, it, it takes time to do that. And so in, in, in honor of the moment or just to recognize the moment, everything stands still. But yet when I, when I think about this birth account of the Savior of the world, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, what I find and, and, and kind of what hit me is that it seems like even though this is the biggest thing this world will ever know, the biggest one, the greatest one, the Savior of the world has come. God himself comes down, which makes Christianity different than everything else because we're not working to get to him. He came down on a rescue mission for us. And yet in, in the span of time when this took place, Sometimes it seems like life is just going on, like nothing has changed, like this monumental event has not happened. The Savior has not just come upon this earth, been born in a manger in humble means, in, hum in a humble way. It almost feels like that all the world is just going on, like this is not just taking place. And I'm just thinking to myself, how can this be? How can the circumstances be that we're in place when the Savior of the world came. And so I started thinking and, and looking back through the passages of Scripture that led us to this point in Luke chapter 2 when, when, when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords stepped on this earth or came down to this earth for you and for me. And I was thinking through and trying to process it through. But um, it, it, one of the things, the first point that I want to kind of bring to light for us is that the Father did his part to prepare us for this monumental event. So the fact that the world went on like it, like it always seemed to have had been going on and that there wasn't, for me, for how big this was, there wasn't enough that was paying attention and was noticing it, but yet God had did everything that, that he could possibly do and more than we deserve to prepare the way for his son to come. And I started thinking about all the way, hundreds of years before, the things that God had foretold, the detail that he had included to make sure that you and I and the the world did not miss this monumental event. And it takes us all the way back to Isaiah chapter 7. So we're going to run through some scriptures here. Uh, so just bear with me. And you're, you're welcome to turn uh, with me as we go through. But we're primarily going to be in Isaiah for now. But Isaiah, go all the way back to Isaiah 7 verse 14. And this is one that we, we know and we read a lot this time of year. But look at what Jesus said. Look at what God says. Look at the detail in verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh, so the detail in that, that when his son comes, that, that he's going to be born of a virgin, that she's going to conceive, that he's going to be called Emmanuel hundreds of years before this event ever happens, before he ever comes, God was already trying to get us ready for it because he didn't want his people or anyone else to miss this huge moment in time when he and his love and in grace and mercy was going to come down was going to send his own son so that a way could be made for us to be reconciled to him. Uh, and I carry on, you flip over in my Bible anyway, one page and you, you pick up in Isaiah 9, verse number six, and it says this, for unto us a child is born, 
Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So even again, the detail in Isaiah 9, right? And and all the great things, great characteristics that would embody this God-man, this Jesus that would come, the Savior of the world. He will be called Wonderful and Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Like, he is going to be incredible. He is going to be epic. And he is going to come for you and for me. and, And God was paving the way for that. Flip on a few chapters over to chapter 42 of Isaiah again. I told you, we're going to be in Isaiah for a little bit this morning. Uh, But in verse number 6 and 7, Isaiah 42, 6 and 7 says this. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. And I, I get super pumped about that because we know that the invitation was extended to the Gentiles. And so Jesus came as a light to the Gentiles as well. So we pray. Praise God can be saved and and, and our salvation is in Jesus as well. In verse 7 it says, To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. And then finally in in Isaiah 53, he says this. In Isaiah 53, the whole chapter is incredible. All all the word is incredible, but the whole chapter is incredible. But I just want to read the first couple verses. This is what it says. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before... For him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry, a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Uh, so again, vivid details about what we should expect when Jesus comes, so that when he comes, and then on top of that, God the Father said, look, I'm going to send John the Baptist. He's going to be born in close proximity, close time frame, and he's going to pave the way for my son. So as if to say God was reaching out and saying, I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. This, my son is coming. He's coming on a rescue mission and he's coming for you. And so over and over again, I just look at this and I see, you know, like God is doing everything that, that it possible so that we don't miss it. So that in that moment, in that monumental moment, time would stand still, time would stop so that we could pay attention and worship and reverence the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as he comes. You know, just like I thought about 9-11 and how time seemed to stand still. Oh, what an, uh, what an event in comparison to this. I mean, this should have been the moment that the world should have been looking, right? We're looking for it and, and seeking it and longing after it. But yet, when I look at it, it looks very different. You know, so I, I was thinking, number one, that God had done everything that he could do so, so that people would pay attention, so that the world would be ready because God's desire, his love, he wants to forgive. He loves us. It's incredible. We don't deserve it, but he loves us so much that he's like, I don't want you to miss what I'm going to do. But as I was thinking through it on that cold or on that dark night in that manger, I was, it, it was almost like as I was reading through Luke 2, it was like the world was just going on like it has always gone on, like life was continuing on. Here, here comes the Savior of the world, the Virgin Mary, giving birth to the Son of God who's come for us, and yet everything just seems to be happening as normal. And I read in Luke 2, and you all know it, you may have read it this morning before you came uh, into a time of worship, or you've you've surely read it recently, hopefully, but it says in in verse 1, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. So I was reading through, I was like, okay, so the taxing's taking place, I mean, we still get taxed today, I mean, it's just like everything's rolling, right, everything's going on. The world is progressing and moving and, and all the while, all around it, there is this biggest event in all of history and all eternity that has just taken place. And yet it seems like it, it, it alarmed me because I was like, why are more not paying attention to this Savior? 
And so I started looking at, uh, at the few that seemed to notice it in the past few weeks. If you've joined in with us, we've talked about the wise men. We've talked about the shepherds. And, and in the process of that, we've talked about some groups that really didn't seem to pay much mind to this, this Savior being born. And one of those groups were the religious leaders, right? The religious leaders, the wise men, a, a while after he was born even, the wise men came and we talked about this and they were looking for where do we find this this. Savior. And, 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 and the religious leaders knew. They had studied scripture. They knew what the expectation was. But yet in that moment, we see that they weren't really concerned. It wasn't causing them to stir. They were just hanging out where they were. And I'm like, what are you, ta- what are you doing? Like, do you not understand who he is? But it seemed like that there were very few that even noticed it. Secondly, and, 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 and not only the wise men, but Herod. Herod sought after it, but we know and we talked about the fact that Herod sought after it just for the simple fact that he wanted to try to kill this, this one that was uh, bringing competition to his throne or potentially this other king that would be a rival to him. He said, I want to get rid of him. And so we find out and we know that he ends up basically sanctioning a a murder of any child two years old and younger uh, at around that time because he was just trying to get rid of him. So even the ones that seemed to be paying attention were doing so seemingly for the wrong reasons. And I was thinking, that just doesn't make sense to me. You know, and my mind goes to, to this time period and, and to that, that dark night and that, that manger scene. And I think, how can we miss the biggest thing in all eternity, like the biggest thing that will ever, ever, ever be done for us? But yet, it seems to be happening. And then I came to possibly one of the most alarming verses in all Scripture, and that is uh, the, the second part of Luke 2, 7. Uh, and this is what it says. I'll, I'll read the whole verse to you this morning because just to kind of, so you, you recall the verse. And she brought forth, uh, of course, Mary, her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. And, and here it is, because there was no room for them in the inn. And I I come to that place and I was like, and I know you've probably heard messages that kind of skirt around this or talk about this directly, but the reality behind the fact that the king of everything, like the king of kings, the mighty rescuer himself, when it was time for him to come and come for all mankind, there was no room. How can that be? How can there not be room for the king of all the world? And and, and as I just resonated on that and I thought about that, I mean, it's really disturbing when you think about it to think, you know, he comes in the humblest of means and from the very beginning, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that for any of us would have said, this isn't, you know, we don't have to put up with this. Like, this is crazy. What other king will you find that there's no room for him? Except, of course, the king of everything, the king of kings and lord of lords. No room. I thought, how absurd is that? But, but as I thought about that and, 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 and brought that into our own context and, and in our own lives, here's the reality, I think. The practical side of this is, is this, I think, is that sometimes our life is kind of lived like this. Like, there are monumental things that, that Jesus wants to do in your and my life. There are uh, miraculous things that he wants to do. There are lives that he wants to save. There are missions that he wants to send us in. Uh, but the problem the problem is, is because we live life at such a fast pace, because we're so busy, that oftentimes we say the same thing that the innkeeper said in this day, Jesus, we simply just don't have room for you. You know, we get busy and we get wore out and we have all these responsibilities and our schedule's so full, we have to get additional calendars to just keep up with all that we have on the day and everything is going on and everything is busy and we kind of get comfortable and complacent with life the way that it is to the point that when Jesus said, but I want this for you, we say, I'm sorry, I just don't have time for you today. Jesus, there, there, there just isn't any room. You see, it's incredible to me that in the world that we live in, 
the name of Jesus is the name that a lot of people don't want to hear. And, 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 and for us, that, for you and I that have faith, we think, well, what, this is the, the most important thing. This is, he's the biggest, he's the rescuer. He's done everything. There's never been anybody that loved you like Jesus did. But yet, so many people live, even, even folks claiming to be Christian, live like they don't have room for him. And so I, I get into Luke 2, and as I get into Luke 2, I just, I look at this and I think to myself, like, like oh my goodness, how, how can this be? This is, this is impossible. There's no room for the king. That doesn't make sense. You couldn't move around the schedule a little bit so you could get the king in a room. You couldn't kind of manipulate and ask this one to leave. This is a, a lady having a baby. And, and, and yet, no, there's no room. There's no room. And, and, and so many times in the life of Christians even, and, and church folks, they get so busy that they can't make it to church or they can't get into their word or they're not spending time with the Lord. And you say you couldn't move around your schedule a little bit. You couldn't change some things and make a priority, Jesus a priority in your life. And so many times it feels like, they don't say it to me, but it feels like the, what their life shows is that they simply don't have room. You see, they, they can't move these other things around for the king. And, and it breaks my heart, and I'm sure it breaks your heart to, to even possibly contemplate this or think about this, this reality. But uh, the challenge for you and I is that uh, the, the question, I guess, really, that comes in the form of a challenge is, do we live like we don't have room for the Savior today? Do you live like you don't have room for the Savior today? When people look at your life, do they see your life and your life is putting Christ as priority, as, as Christ is sitting? on the throne of their life, of your life? Do they see your life in that way? Or instead, do they see you making everything else a priority? Sports and extracurriculars and, and all these things. Do they see that you're rejoicing over uh, your sports team winning more than you are on the resurrected tomb, the empty tomb where the Savior is alive? Do they see that, that you're more willing to go out of your way to do things for this rather than for him? I mean, what do they see in your and my life? Do they see us? treating Jesus like the innkeeper did and just simply saying, sorry, we don't have room for you today. And I thought, you know, in that, in that the stillness of that night, I mean, how unbelievable is it that this would be where we find the Savior? I mean, we know the story, we know the account, we know this is how it goes, and we probably thought through this, but it is, it is like something that the kings of the world, you would hardly, it'd be hard pressed to ever find another king or another heir to the throne that was born on an occasion in a, in a manner like this, that was born in a place like this, like that just didn't happen, like that like you took care of the kings and, and you protected them and you guarded them, and, 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 and so this is like, no, I mean, we wouldn't find this, but yet Jesus, this is where he was. And from the very beginning, uh, we see the humility in our wonderful Savior. He was born in a manger. But one of the things that I realized, even though God set things in motion, God established and, and tried to prepare us for it, yeah, the world kind of, life went on just as it does for us sometimes. God wants to do something. He's moving in people's lives around us. He's calling us for a bigger purpose and a bigger plan, and we don't pay attention to it because we just don't have room. There are some in this account, in this time, that are paying attention and that do acknowledge him for who he is. And I want to I wanna close today or end with this final point, looking at these that did, and there's some characteristics to them that I think is really key for you and for me, and, and I, wanna, I wanna share that with you today. There's two, primarily, as you read on in Luke 2, named Simeon and Anna, and you may, you may have remember them, and you may have read them here recently, read about them here recently, but there are some characteristics of these two that I think are, are key for you and I so that we don't end up saying, Jesus, we don't have room for you. So that we can reach a place in our walk and in our faith where we, we acknowledge him for who he is, where we listen and hear him for where he tells us he wants us to go. When we are obedient to him because we're paying attention and we're ready because we acknowledge that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So let's start with Simeon. 
Jump on down in Luke 2 with me this morning in verse number 25, and I want you to see this. I'm going to read about both of them together, and we'll just take, take some time and listen this morning, if you will. It says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people, of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign which shall be spoken against, yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of, of many hearts may be revealed." And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Aser, Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem." So, so Simeon and Anna, I want you to see this about them. The reality behind them is this, is that there are some characteristics when it comes to these two where, where that, that made it to where they would not miss the Savior. And I want to share these with you because whether it's Christmas time or whether it's 2023, the reality is, is that somebody loved you enough that they were willing to be born in a manger, coming to this earth in order, knowing that they would suffer, knowing that they would be a abused and spit on and beaten and that the cross would be the end on this earth for them for, the, for that moment, that, that the cross would be taken to, to endure the wrath of God on our behalf, that, that there would be one that would come to pay the price that you and I could never pay. And, and, and he would be taken off that cross by Joseph of Arimathea and put in a tomb and, and by others would be helped to, to put in a tomb. And on third day, he would resurrect. He would be risen and risen indeed so that you and I could be redeemed. And so for you and I, we need to always acknowledge whether it's Christmas or whether it's Easter or whether it's any other day throughout the year that there is somebody that loved us enough that they were willing to come. Even though... It was going to be a great price that they would pay. There would be a great sacrifice that they would endure. But you see, the key component for Simeon and Anna, I don't know if you picked up on it, there is a key component, a key characteristic that really helped them not to miss. And I want to tell you what it is. It's really simple. They were looking for Jesus. So, so they were looking, God had told them, he had foretold about it. They had studied the scripture. They knew what he had said. So when, when Jesus came, they were already looking for him. They saw the opportunity. They acknowledged him for who he is. I love Simeon's response. Um, and, and it says that in verse number 28, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy ser thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. You see, they, they were expectant. They were ready. They were looking for Jesus. That's what it seemed like their heart longed for. And so what does the Bible say? If you seek, what will happen? You will find, Right? God says in James, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. You see these people, Simeon and Anna, they were looking. And so when Jesus came, they didn't miss him. They weren't the ones that saying, I just don't have room. Instead, they saw him coming. They knew and they acknowledged God revealed it to them because they were hungry and they were looking. And so they were not numbered with the ones that, that did not recognize these religious leaders and Herod and, and so many. Uh, they, they acknowledged because they were ready. 
You see, you and I, a lot of times we'll say to ourselves within ourselves when bad things happen, where is God? Or I don't hear God. Or where's the miracles? Or why don't we see what we used to see? Where's the great revivals like the great awakening? You know, where is all this stuff taking place like it used to? And the reality is, is that we can't expect it if we're not looking. If we're not seeking after Jesus, not, not seeking after good works, not seeking after uh, our, our own benefits, not seeking after just a, an emotional feeling of love, but seeking after Jesus himself, acknowledging him for who he is, the savior of the world, acknowledging him for the great rescuer that he is, not just these, uh, these, off, uh, these uh, sidebars all over the place, these uh, preference-based things, these insignificant things, but seeking seeking diligently after him. And you know, the amazing thing is, is that I've found, and probably some of you have, that when you will seek after him, he will be found. Like if we will come to him in a repentant heart and we will truly, in a true and pure heart, strive to know him more, maybe we ask a question and we say, God, I don't understand. And he takes us into his living word and he says, this is what the answer is. But over and over again, God shows with Simeon and Anna, if we will be ready, if we will be looking, then God will do more than what we could ever imagine because he's faithful, because he's a loving father, because he's gracious and he's merciful. So, so when I read this account, I thought, you know, there's so many. The world seems to be going on just as it was. No one seems to be paying attention. Why are there not more? Why are there not masses? We look at ball games and things in our world today, and the stadiums are filled, and people are re- celebrating, and they're rejoicing. And it makes you think sometimes, if people didn't know better, where, what would they think the church was, the, 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 the arena or the actual church? You know, and so the reality is, is that so many times, even in our world today, People are going to and fro and living life and they're not expecting and they're not looking. And all the while the Savior has came and died and rose again so that we can have life and nobody's looking for him. But I think the challenge for us today is this. In in our celebration of Christmas, in our celebration in every other day of the year, uh, our celebrating such a Savior we have to be on guard against this mentality of I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna go through life. I'm just gonna live life. I'm gonna go like clockwork every day. We have to get out of that and we have to live life looking for a savior, looking for our savior. We have to live life with our eyes set on Jesus, seeking after him and not just live haphazardly or casually like like we forget that he even came and died and rose again. We have to treat him and acknowledge him as we live life as the, the precious son of God, the only one that loves us the way that he does, that will ever love us like that. We have to acknowledge him for who he is every day. Don't be the one that says, Jesus, I just don't have time. He should get the first fruit of your time. And I truly believe if you and I will set it in our heart to seek him, like Anna and and Simeon, to spend time praying, fasting in the word, to spend time drawing near, I think we would see him do amazing things, more incredible than we could ever ask or think. But it doesn't come if we're not paying attention. God may be doing things sometimes and we're focused on all all, all the wrong things, all the wrong areas. So the challenge for you and I is this, whether you're saved or lost, it's a twofold challenge. If you are lost and you've never experienced Jesus, he's came for you. He's he's died, he's rose again, he's paid your price so that you don't have to. You couldn't anyway, but so that you don't have to. We couldn't couldn't bear what Jesus bore for us and on our behalf, he's already done it for us so that you could be forgiven and you could be saved, but you gotta reach out for him. You've got to receive such a gift. You've got to surrender a life to him. You can't just expect for it to happen. It doesn't all, like you have to reach out for him. If you cry out to Jesus, if you pray to him and say, I I believe, I believe that you have given your life, that you are risen from the dead and you've done it for me, even though I don't deserve it. I'm a sinner and I fall short and my life and forgiveness is found in you. And you turn your life over to Jesus. He will rescue you and he will save you. 
but you've got to cry out to him. If you're a Christian today and you say, I don't know, I don't know where God has been in my life. It seems like I can't hear him anymore. It seems like I don't see him move. Then take a moment today. Take a moment in the next few days, however long it takes, and think, are you living your life as if you don't have room for Jesus in it? And if you're doing that, then it's no wonder that you're not seeing Jesus move. He's not went anywhere. I can assure you, God is right there. He is always faithful. He doesn't move. It's us that moves away from him. So if that's you today, if you can honestly say, if you think about your life, what do people see that is most important to you? Jesus should be number one. If he's not, then now's the time to get that right. Now's the time to recommit. Now's the time to say, cry out to him and say, Lord Jesus, help me not to treat you like there's no room because he deserves to be on the throne of our life. I don't know what God is calling you to today. I don't know what God is calling you all to in 2023, but I wanna challenge you to, if you're lost, Jesus is the answer. If you're saved, Jesus is the answer. But the key is, is he's got to be priority. Let's look for him. Let's reach for him. And as we do so, entering into a new year, let's try to be better for him than we were last year and and seek him. And the amazing thing is, even though we don't deserve it, he's so faithful that when we seek him, we will find. And he says that. So that is your challenge today. I hope your celebration of Christmas is great as you continue on throughout your day today. I wanna pray for us here to kind of close things out. Uh, but remember, that's, Jesus is the reason for not only this season, but for every other day in all of your life and for all eternity. This is the greatest thing that we will ever know. The greatest one we will ever know came as a babe in a manger and he came for you and for me. He came in obedience to the Father. It was God's way, God's rescue mission, right? And he came with with a love for you and for me that saw him all the way to the cross, saw him into the tomb, saw him resurrected in victory so that in him and in him alone, we can have victory as well. Let me pray for you today. Uh, And I hope you have a great rest of the day. Let's pray. Lord, just thank you so much for Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that all of us, wherever we may be today, that we would always remember how monumental this, uh, this, this time, this, this birth was, that we will never lose sight, Lord Jesus, of you and how amazing you are and how you are everything, that we can't do anything without you, that you have, you have died and rose again so that we can be forgiven and we can have life. Help us not to live like there's no room in our life for you. Please help us to live so that everybody around us can see that you are number one. We love you so much, Jesus, and help us just to show you that by the way we live our life. Thank you for dying and being such an amazing Savior, being alive today so that we can have life. And we just praise you. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. at the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It has always been It's always been you Jesus Jesus at the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all from beginning to the end it will always be it's always been you Jesus Jesus Nothing else matters Nothing in this world will do Cause Jesus, you're the center And everything revolves around you Jesus, you 
Jesus be the center of my life Jesus be the center of my life From beginning to the end It will always be, it's always been you Nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Because Jesus, you're the center. And everything revolves around you. Jesus, you the center of it all. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about it's all about you from my heart to the heavens Jesus be the center it's all about you yes it's all about you Jesus be the center of your church Jesus be the center of your church And every knee will bow And every tongue shall confess you, Jesus Jesus, nothing else matters Nothing in this world will do Cause Jesus, you're the center and Everything revolves around you Jesus, you At the center of it all Y'all have a great Christmas celebration as you continue on. Thank you for being here with us today.